What's up, sons? It's Blind Rod with Sava Tech. Once again, I have yet another Talking Head video for you. Today, we're going to be taking a look at Ethereum versus Polkadot. Yes, the two big daddies in the DApps arena, and hopefully, you will get some sort of information out of this that can help you make good decisions in regards to both. But hold on to your seats because this is going to be probably the most technical driven versus video for a coin that you've seen on YouTube, especially when we're talking about these two coins. I've spent about eight hours of research and hopefully I can relay this information to you guys in the easiest manner, but don't worry. I got lost writing it. If you get a little lost, let me know in the comment section and I'll try to clear it up for you. But first, are you a miner? Would you like to hide the location of your mining rigs by using a VPN? Would you rather do it at the router level? Well, check out Flash Routers with the affiliate link in the description below. Flash Routers basically pre-flashes routers for their customers with DDWRT and then they provide an easy to use GUI for you to log in to your favorite VPN service provider, such as NordVPN. I have my mining rigs behind it, and a lot of people ask, why would you do that? Well, IP location, of course, it's easier to find people with IP information on a if they're mining so you know whatever you can do to protect yourself there's also other steps in that that i could go over in another video let me know if you're interested in more security driven content for mining down in the comments without further ado let's talk about ethereum and polkadot so what are they trying to do ethereum and polkadot both aim to provide a space for developers to create dApps what are dApps? Dapps are decentralized applications. There are different forms of these applications that have different, of course, purposes and functionalities. All that really matters that you need to know is that they both are aiming to provide a space for developers to develop on the blockchain different applications, right? Decentralized applications aim to remove centralization of the internet by not relying on server infrastructure such as AWS or Azure. But where this gets a little confusing is that when we're talking about these two coins, both of them plan to move to proof of stake, whereby a lot of people are using virtual private servers for staking. And that's a topic, of course, for another video. It's just something that I thought was worth mentioning. So what are the main differences? Well, the first difference is gonna be that Polkadot is a younger coin. However, it has been built up from the ground to solve scalability issues that Ethereum is trying to solve with Ethereum 2.0. Yes, we have to talk about Ethereum 1.0 versus Ethereum 2.0 in this video as well, because they will, I guess, function completely different as ETH 1.0 makes the transition. ETH 2.0 will try to solve this with what is called sharding. A shard is a thread of execution. DOT, however, tries to solve this at a very base level with parachains and parathreads. You'll see why this matters as we talk about the architecture more. The difference between a parachain and a parathread is purely economic. Parachains must be registered through a normal means of Polkadot, i.e. a governance proposal. While parathreads have a fixed fee for registration, in theory, decreasing the cost, but not guaranteeing inclusion, as it functions similarly to the current Ethereum gas fees. So you know how to get your transaction ahead of everybody's, you pay a little bit more in the gas fee on Ethereum 1.0. And if EIP 1559 goes through, you pay a little bit more in the tip to get your transaction ahead in the line. This means in theory, even after ETH 2.0, DOT will offer additional functionality thanks to parachain and parathreads versus purely sharding. Think of it as ETH 1.0 and ETH 2.0 hybrid from an architecture standpoint. This brings us to the back end development. Currently, ETH uses Solidity and Viper. Solidity is a JavaScript like programming language to just put it in layman's terms and give you an idea with, by, from, so you understand kind of, you've probably heard of 
Python, right? And JavaScript. So Viper, which is also Ethereum, is a Python-like programming language. And so you have two there, Solidity and Viper, two different options for developers to implement. ETH 2.0 won't change their programming language or add a new one. So we don't really have to worry about that from a comparison standpoint. Dot handles things quite a bit differently. It uses Rust and a substrate framework. Rust is a C++ like programming language, while Substrate is purely a web application framework like Express. And that's really going to be important when we're talking about ease of development. Uh, and there are arguments there for both sides. The, the problem is it won't get easier to develop, at least from my understanding from talking to developers, it won't become easier to develop for until more people have started adding to the libraries in, of course, the substrate. So the differences in backend development present the first argument that DOT and ETH are not similar enough to directly compare, meaning that they can coexist to serve different purposes. However, let's still compare them because like that's what we're doing. And so execution environments differ wildly. Let's talk about them. This is the, this is the next huge difference. ETH 1.0 currently uses a single VM because it's a single chain architecture. So if you think about like scalability and why ETH 2.0 needs to happen is purely because of the current, current architecture, right? So ETH 2.0 will use multiple homogeneous shards. So the shards we were talking about, while DOT will use multiple heterogeneous parachains. Yes, this is getting complicated, but stick with me. Here we go. In a homogeneous system, scaling happens with duplication, while in a heterogeneous system, each of them has to be designed and implemented. Excuse me if I'm mispronouncing these. I did try to look it up and I clicked the little play button, but I, you know, the audio thing on Google, I could still be wrong though. This means that technically the execution environment is easier to scale on ETH 2.0, at least until you take into account the major differences in programming language strategies. This is solved using the substrate framework as libraries, like we mentioned before, for developers to call on. Examples are functionalities like accounts, balances, governance, and smart contracts. Still with me? Don't worry, I got lost too. Woo! The takeaway so far is that both Ethereum and Polkadot handle dApps very differently. This continues with composability. ETH 1.0 as it stands can only allow smart contracts to call each other synchronously, meaning essentially single transactions in order. ETH 2.0, once again, needs to solve this for scalability concerns. Smart contracts on 2.0 can call each other synchronously in the same shard or asynchronously between shards. Dot functions the same, just replace the word shard with parachain. Governance is the other big difference between ETH and Dot. Governance is simply a collection of processes to control an entity. Ethereum governance is all off-chain, meaning it could be argued that this was the reason for fraudulent ICO practices during the first crypto boom. DOT offers multiple governance structures for developers to implement, including democracy, council, and treasury modules. This means there would be a route for investors to have a say in any changes. Additionally, this would be key, a key factor in SEC regulations. The Big Daddy Consensus Mechanism. For you miners out here, be prepared to be left in the cold. But ETH 1.0 is proof of work, meaning it's mined, obviously. However, ETH 2.0 will replace this with Casper Proof of Stake. We can do another video on proof of stake versus proof of work. If you want that, let me know in the comment section below. I believe it's already on my list though. So just hit that sub button while you're at it. Quick reminder if you're interested. For now, both ETH and DOT will be proof of stake. DOT now, ETH later, right? That's kind of, eventually they will bo both be proof of stake. DOT will use Babe Grandpa proof of stake. The two main differences between DOT and ETH proof of stake are that in DOT, different voters can cast votes simultaneously for blocks at different heights. And it only depends 
on finalized blocks to affect the fork choice rule of the underlying block production mechanism. In layman's terms, DOT uses a hybrid mechanism and ETH, well, frankly, I don't know what will be the final consensus model. As even though it has started to roll out, I cannot verify it won't change between now and the final implementation. Fees. All right, so this is where another part of a huge difference between these two coins takes place. This is another realm where it's unclear on how ETH wants to handle this. Currently, it is a per call gas metering based system. But as we talked about in EIP 1559, the details are changing. Additionally, EIP 1559 pertains to ETH 1.0. And while it is proposed, uh, per call gas metering will be used in ETH 2.0, the details to me are a little bit fuzzy. If you guys are a little bit more clear on where ETH 2.0 is going with that, let me know in the comment section below. One of the questions I really have too is like, how do we know they're not gonna change it or when they're gonna change it, which as an investor or somebody utilizing it can be uh, quite a big problem really, especially if you're gonna be developing for that system. If the fees are changing and the consensus mechanisms are changing all the time, how do you really be sure as a developer that you're, you're going to be okay, right? Especially with fees so high. And we'll talk about that too in, in just these types of dApps and deploying dApps, right? And what that means for developers because it's very pricey. So if EIP 1559 base fee burn moves into ETH 2.0, I honestly can't imagine stakers would be too happy. I just, I, I think the stakers would be upset, <laughs> but I could be wrong. Dot execution fees will be market cost for parachain slot with unlimited usage on per call para thread fee. Remember we talked about the differences earlier between a para thread and a para chain. So if you call that, the architecture plays a major part, right? On the fee structure, offering multiple solutions for developers to implement, good thing. In conclusion, comparing ETH and DOT is like comparing apples and oranges from a developer's perspective, right? However, from an investor's perspective, DOT resolves major issues that ETH is yet to solve, such as on-chain governance to protect investors and flexible fee models to reduce cost and make it more predictable. This is also coming from the ground up, meaning it will be able to scale out of the box without a DOT 2.0. Now I realized that I looked at the notes pretty much the entire video. Maybe I need a teleprompter if we're gonna be doing more of these videos. It's a lot to take in. It's a lot to do a lot of research on and I would encourage you to go do your own research on these topics, especially when we're talking about dApps, the available coins that will support it out there and so on and so forth. Out of curiosity, I did go check out the latest from Ravencoin because I had recalled that they were supposed to be allowing asset transfers in a token system. There's still nothing yet there. And so I'm a little disappointed. I hope that as an open source project, it starts getting some movement in that realm. Maybe my understanding of what their end goal is, is, is incorrect. But from what I remember in the white paper, that's what they're supposed to be doing. The only two coins that have made it this far for development and having things in their white paper that explain everything from the programming languages to how their consensus models work and how their fees work are Ethereum and Polkadot. That being said, as you know, Ethereum development is like throw it at the wall and see if it sticks and we'll go with it. While Dot, to me, when I read like what Dot's doing, they have it all figured out and they have a plan and they're just building to get to that plan. So as an investor, if I was going to put my money into anything, I think I would lean towards DOT even though it is newer. However, it is important to keep in mind that currently almost all dApps run on Ethereum. It's not like there's a ton of supported applications on DOT yet. That will come with time. I think obviously with the fees, 
it is enticing to look for an alternate option like Polkadot. And that is also why we have been talking about EIP-1559, because at the end of the day, Ethereum is trying to catch up from a technical perspective and from a fee perspective. If it costs you a ton of money to develop applications and run them on your, on your blockchain, it's gonna dissuade developers from obviously using that over a competitor. And before there wasn't really a valid competitor for Ethereum. Now there is, and it's called Polkadot. <laughs> Thanks for watching. I hope this was a good technical analysis for you and you understand a little bit more, not only about Ethereum and Polkadot, but cryptocurrency as a whole, including how, you know, dApps work. If it did hit that bell, only 90% of you are subscribed, so hit that subscribe button, and I will see you next Tuesday.